Hello, my name is Matthew Marquin, and welcome to the fifth video of the Beginner's Guide to Substance Painter. In this particular video, I want to show you guys a little bit about tools and brushes. Now, brushes affect what most of the tools do, so that's why we're going to talk about them in uh, combination in this video. And the tools that we're going to reference are most of the tools that we find up here in the toolbar. So the first tool I have selected is the brush tool or the paint tool up here. Okay, and we're going to talk about some of the hotkeys that work, and these are universal through a lot of the different tools. So one of the clear hotkeys is your brackets, which is either left bracket to shrink your brush and right bracket to increase the size of your brush, which is next to the letter P. Another cool hotkey is shift. So if you click, hold shift, click somewhere else, you can make a straight line. This is actually the same as you would see in Photoshop, and this works, of course, in this view too. All right. Um, if you actually click and hold shift, but then add control to it, you can actually snap it in a angled view. Now, while you can try to make something look, you know, like a perfect horizontal and perfect vertical lines, if you're painting in perspective, you notice that when I look at the front of it, it actually is still curved. In the viewport, it was straight, but it's curved that way. So in order to prevent something like that, and if you really want to paint something straight, A, as long as your UVs are straight, you can either paint them straight on here, or if you come in and actually set this instead of perspective to orthographic, graphic view right now we're in a, a perfect front orthographic view now if I click hold shift and then control and then click again I can add literally absolutely a perfect vertical and horizontal set of lines right so no matter what it is actually perfect so that's on you if you want to try that and make sure that the lines look perfect or you can just eyeball it or whatever but I'm going to switch this back to our perspective view Okay, so those are some of the hotkeys. Some of the other things I want to talk about is things like the lazy mouse. So even though it's a little bit further down the notes, I want to mention it first because once again, it kind of falls under this how the brush works, um, kind of hotkey kind of thing. So if I come in here with a normal squiggle, right? So if I just draw a line, I can just, you see it follows one-to-one -one my brush. However, if I turn my lazy mouse on and I try to do a squiggle, you'll see that it doesn't really let me. What it's doing is it's kind of averaging out uh, my movements and trying to get a cleaner line. Now, obviously, you're not going to try to draw a squiggle with Lazy Mouse on. The point of Lazy Mouse is more for curves. So if I try to do a curve without Lazy Mouse on, you'll see every little movement, every little you know twitch of my hand, you're going to see like all these little cuts, not very smooth. Turn Lazy Mouse on, do the same thing. You get a much smoother line. So this will help you kind of create better looking curves uh, and try to control a little bit of that you know shake in your hand. Okay, the higher the amount, the more of control, the lower the amount, the closer it is to not being on at all. You can go all the way to zero, which to me seems weird since you can just leave it off, but you can also go all the way up to 20. You can fool around those settings, figure out what you like. I think the default is set to eight. Uh, and you can even type a number in here. So you click on that and I type in eight, I can go back to the default. But we're going to shut off Lazy Mouse here. Whoop, click that again. All right, so. I'm also going to shut this little window off here because we keep getting it. You guys have told you before, if you just go to settings, you go to general, you can shut off your keyboard helper and it won't show up every time you hit a cock key. All right. So let's start talking about some of the properties. Okay. Over here of your brushes. And you'll find that over here under the properties section and brush. So uh, first thing I do want to show, of course, that you always have a preview window of your brush, the color that you're using. You can change the color further down here. Okay, but as you choose different brushes, you'll notice the preview will change, the alpha the brush is using will change, and a lot of the settings, which are default per brush, will also change. Okay, so these are dependent on the brush, but all of these can be changed once you click on them. Okay, so size can also be changed here without using the bracket keys. But you'll also notice things like flow and, uh, and stroke opacity. So let's talk a little bit about those. So I'm going to draw a line. Let me make this a little bit bigger, and I'm going to zoom in just a bit here. So I'm going to draw a line. Okay, so we've got a line going on here of me just drawing normally with the 100% flow and 100% uh, stroke opacity. If I go down and drop my flow and draw a line again, you'll notice another difference. Right now, it's starting to be a little bit opaque, but uh, or you'll have a little bit of opacity to it. I mean, um, but you'll actually see you can start seeing each brush stroke, and this is actually controlled by spacing. If I increase the spacing and I paint again, you'll notice that you're going to get you know more of an obvious kind of blend between each one of those. If you set your spacing literally to zero, and we'll do that, or one, which is the lowest you can do, I draw it again. It's going to be a little bit more smooth. You'll have to actually drop your flow all the way down to almost you know, to the bottom there uh, in order to see 
that it does kind of look like a dropped opacity, but it's not the same thing as opacity. So you can see all these different lines are doing different things depending on flow and spacing and such. But I'm going to put my flow all the way back to 100% again. I'm going to drop my opacity way down. And then you can see there's a difference, of course, with how that line looks too to this one. So dropping your opacity, dropping your flow, they're all a little bit different. Um, and uh, obviously playing around with your spacing, I can increase the spacing there and you'll see the same thing. So we'll get a similar effect, but what flow does is it actually, you can even see it here, right, with, with this, is that when it overlaps with the previous brush, it kind of adds to it. So you'll get areas of lighter and darker with the flow, but when you just drop the opacity, even though the spacing is off, they're all going to look the same. So that's part of the difference behind uh, basically flow and, and stroke opacity, okay, and how spacing affects it. Now also, if I just set my stroke opacity and flow to 100% you can see what spacing does at one you can get that kind of straight line uh, because it just basically keeps drawing infinitely uh, but if you set it way high you can actually if you wanted you can start making polka dots you know or whatever uh, in the scene and make a set of of um, um, just dots that move along all right um, so that's kind of what spacing does. Angle will rotate it. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell the rotation of something when it's a circle. So if I choose, say, something like this fibers thing here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to shut the angle jitter off, and we'll talk about jitter in a moment. But now you'll see that if I click in here and I paint, you'll see that it kind of has a straight angle. I can rotate it, and you'll see it update up here, and it will also update in the viewport. And you'll see that now whenever I click, it will be that new angle. So you can play with the angle, and if you want it to be permanent all the time, you know, it's something that's fine. But I tend to find that a lot of brushes work great when you use and play around with the jitters. And jitters are basically randomness to the brush. So let's undo these uh, little um, paints there. But what we're going to do is I'll show you each jitter on and off. And so the first jitter is your size jitter. If you increase the amount of it, you'll see, you'll even see once again in the viewport there. But if I click, you'll notice that I'm going to start getting random sizes. And the greater the amount of the jitter is, the more randomness or the larger disparity you can have. So if you want just a slight difference in size, you can have a lower jitter. And then when I paint, I'll get different sizes, but they'll be just very slight, almost unperceivable. All right. The higher you do, it can be pretty, pretty dramatic. Like if I click in here, you can get like that one is absolutely tiny. You can barely even see it. And you see how if I click, I just get some random sizes here. Okay, so it's up to you how you want to use that. I'm going to shut, shut that off. Then you have the flow jitter. So we've already talked about flow, but this will have like different variants of, you know, your opacity and such, such as you're painting. So you can just have it so that it's you know, sometimes more flow, less flow and so on. Uh, you also have angle jitter. So instead of trying to control the angle and always be the same thing, this will randomly throw them in different circles, right? So you'll get all sorts of different angles uh, randomly as you paint. And once again, the higher you put it, the more randomness to the angle. And then position jitter is kind of, it'll throw it off from the position of where the mouse clicks. So if I click here, you'll actually see that the paint was much further away. I click here, same thing. That's just a little bit. That one's way out there and so on. So that would just kind of throw them all over the place. So if you, you can theoretically put, you know, jitter on everything and then just get this complete randomness in your brush like the angle the position and the flow okay so that's up to you how you want to play with any of these jitters okay but the next thing I wanted to talk about real quick before we go uh, any further down is the follow path one this one's actually pretty awesome uh, in general if I let me find a brush that actually takes advantage of the follow path so we'll do something like stitches here and stitches automatically have the follow path on but I'll shut them off for a moment so you can see what's going on stitches are just basically these little lines right and if I click and I paint you'll see that these lines kind of do this. And this is also because the spacing's up. I mean, if you wanted to make a straight line, you can literally put them down and do this. But then, you know, you might as well just use a normal brush if you're going to do that. Anyway, the idea, of course, is that as I rotate my brush, they'll all stay the same angle. The cool thing about follow path is when you turn that on and I rotate my brush, it will follow the direction of the brush. So this is called stitching for a reason because you can kind of paint a stitch, right? And you can follow along a surface. So that's pretty cool. That doesn't work on all brushes. You'll see some brushes, especially if the angle of the brush is hard to tell, right? Just like a circle, it's, it's going to be almost, you know, imperceivable. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, when you're using the follow path. Now, let's talk about some of the other things down here. You'll see down here, and this actually changes per brush. So if I choose different brushes, you'll see other things like this is hardness and roundness. This other one over here was hardness and squeeze. So it does change, but here's the alpha that is associated with your brush. You can even change the alpha if you want. I mean, you can have the same brush and just switch to a different alpha if you want. Um, but what you can also see is as far as some of these are concerned, and let's just use you know this brush again. Uh, if I set the hardness to 100%, 
you'll see that each one of these, okay, and it should, let's see, how come you're not working here? There we go. Okay, so you'll see that each one of these will be just completely solid, okay? Now, if I change my hardness all the way down to zero, you're now gonna get a softer edge. This works the same with your, like your default brushes. Default hard just looks like this. Default soft looks like this, right? So that's the difference between a hard and a soft brush. It basically just makes kind of like this uh, feathering of the edges of your line, okay? So that's kind of how that works. Let's go back to a brush that has the different settings. But you can see, and then things like squeeze and roundness. So you'll see this sometimes changes. That just changes a little bit about the, the uh, well, let me try holding the brush here and painting. So you can kind of see and actually increase the size of this too. So we see it a little bit better. But here you go. So if I paint like that with my uh, squeeze low versus my squeeze high, you'll see that uh, this particular brush is actually a pretty large um, square shape. So if you squeeze it, it just kind of mushes it down a little bit and you can kind of see the difference up here. So you'll get really thin ones if you go further down and a much thicker brush if you go all the way to the top. So that's kind of the same thing with roundness. It kind of mushes it. So it's all the same thing, really. It's just depending on the shape, they're just going to rename it a little bit. So just know that those settings are down there. And then, of course, you have these settings that I talked about in a different video. I don't need to uh, re-mention these, as I said before, I covered in the video. But you do have whatever, you know, your uh, particular settings, right? So your texture, if it has a base color, metallic all those things you'll find those things down here you can affect them all at the same time click them on and off so you can paint on them. I can add emissive and now emissives down there and so on or I can shut them off and then they don't exist down there and so on but like I said I'm not gonna spend the time to re-talk about this as I did cover them in a separate video so let's undo all of this all right so that's pretty cool pretty fun to work with just got that one little line up there. Okay, erase that. Um, but the next thing I want to talk about is your quick mask. And a quick mask is pretty fun to work with. I'm just going to go back to a default brush here. Uh, quick mask, it's easy to work with. The hotkey is T to turn it on. And basically anywhere you paint, right? So we can come in here, we can paint either on the model or in the texture over here. Uh, and then we just paint a mask. So this black section will be the mask. Okay. Once you've done that, you can toggle it back with T to get back into paint. And now I can come in here and just paint, but you'll see that it won't paint on the mask area. Okay. Um, so this is basically blocking it from painting. If you want to invert the mask, you can hit I, right? So when you're in the, um, um, in the mask itself, you can invert it right now. You can't, you can't do it, but if we hit T again, and then I hit I within the mask, now you can invert it. So whatever you painted is where you can paint versus the other way around, right? But that only works in the actual mask mode of being T or quick mask mode. Okay. But then if you want to get rid of it, you just hit the hotkey Y. So now I come in here and I hit Y and now you can see that that area has been masked off. So this is a quick way to uh, mask it up. But of course, if you hit T, uh, you can come in here and you can actually change the brush you use to mask things too. So it doesn't have to be the default brush. You can choose any brush to mask things off with. And now if I was to get out of this and go in and paint all the way around this thing here and then hit Y to get rid of the mask, you'll see that it now has that opposite effect. Okay, so that's kind of how the uh, mask works. So pretty cool tool, um, but just a nice thing to do uh, if you're going to want to do a temporary mask on a certain part of the geometry as opposed to using masks and smart masks over here in your layer stack. Okay, so uh, moving on, right? So we've covered pretty much all of this. Moving on, now we have the eraser tool. So the eraser tool, I don't know if I should have to tell you this. Pretty simple. We click on eraser and you erase. Same thing. You choose a brush. The brush will change how the eraser works and so on. So pretty simple concept. Um, by the way, I didn't mention this, but a lot of these tools also have physical modes. And physical modes basically just mean that you can paint using, um, um, and you can even see it over here, uh, using physics. right? So you paint and it just kind of you know, sometimes they kind of go out of control. They can be fun. You can do a physical paint. You can do a physical eraser, do the same thing. Um, but I typically don't use those. If I'm going to do anything physical painting anyways, I come over here to particles and particles will do the same thing. Like if I click on broken glass, get up here and just click on the head, you'll see that it will create that. The longer you hold it, the more it will do the effect. Okay. You can also do things like burn. So I can move this across the surface and do a burn. So it's pretty cool, but this is all dependent. Uh, fracture is a fun one to do too. Right, I'll just create this like fracture and break all the way till it goes to the end of the surface. Right, I'll just keep going until it gets to all the ends of the surface. Right, which is a pretty fun one to do if you actually use that with a with a black brush or a dark brush. It looks fairly convincing, especially if you add a height map to it and have it go down a little bit. 
Okay. In fact, the animation was still going 17 seconds later. Right. Um, I don't use these a lot, but they can be a little bit fun. But as I mentioned before, your computer and the power of your computer will also be dependent on whether those things work properly or not. But yes, you do have the physical versions of a lot of these brushes, even though I tend to not use them, just so you know, they do exist. All right. So the, uh, the next tool that I want to talk about is the projection tool, which we find right up here. Now, when the projection tool is put on, it will kind of gray out the screen a little bit. And that's because it's basically allowing you to use uh, an image to paint onto it. So you can actually use either either an image or you can use like a material and, and kind of project that. Uh, I don't find the material part as useful. I find that if you want to paint a decal, like you have an alpha out PNG file, right? So you created an image, you cut out the background, you saved it as a PNG. This is where it finds, you know, I find that it works the best. So actually I'm going to go in and load one up. So I'm going to go over to my folder here and I have a little Mr. Met. Yes, I'm a big Mets fan. I'm going to drop him in there. So I've already cut him out of the background. So what we're going to do is we're just going to call this whatever Met. We'll leave it in there. Uh, and then I'm going to choose on this and set this to be an alpha. All right. And we're going to just do it for the current session because, you know, I don't want to keep this in here. So we'll just hit import. So you should now see Mr. Met is in there. So in order to get him into uh, into the projection is once you have the projection tool set, you kind of come over here to your projection properties and you want to make sure you dump it into the material mode section. So that's all we have to do is I grab him, drag him into material mode. And now you'll see that he is a projection on here and I can actually just start painting and I will paint him on said uh, model or geometry wherever you see him. So I don't want him to be that big. What I'm going to do is I'm going to choose body. Okay, and so we're going to paint on the body. So maybe I'll zoom in on the body here, right? Something to this effect so they can have maybe a logo on a t-shirt or something like that. And then we're going to use the hotkeys that allows us to change the projection as we see on the screen. So if you actually hold it down S, right, and you use these different tools here. So hold down S plus left mouse button, you can rotate the image, right? So we can kind of do that. If I let go of that and use middle mouse button instead, I can pan it. And then, of course, if we use the right mouse button, we can shrink it. So we can come down here and shrink it. Right, so I can get it maybe more like a t-shirt size like that. Hit middle mouse button, kind of pan it up more towards the middle, then let go. And now I can just paint him right in. So we can go like this, kind of paint him in, right? And there you go. So now we have ourselves a little decal. So just make sure you don't paint too far um, so that you don't like get it somewhere else. But once again, uh, make sure you're always on a right layer to paint. Like if you're on a fill layer or something, it won't work. So just have an empty layer when you're using it. And there you go. So now I can shut that off, right? So or just choose something different. And you can see that I now have a little Mets logo painted on him. So this is what it works great for uh, is that kind of stuff. And you can even see that he is alpha out. Uh, even if I was to say, take a smart material, come in here and just drag anything in. Let's just drag in this copper right here, put it on the bottom, right? And as it loads in, give it a second. There you go. So you can kind of see that it works as a pretty nice decal. So this is actually a really, really awesome tool when you have things like signage or other kind of decals like wall text, stuff like that, you know, any kind of, and you can even use it with, you know, damage and other stuff. So um, kind of any grunge maps that you might have work, you can do the same thing. You can use it as a projection uh, and paint it like that instead of using the paintbrush. So it's up to you how you want to do that. All right. So there you go. I'm just going to hide this because it's a little bit more distracting. We'll just leave that awesome Mets logo there. Okay. So the other things that we got going on is our polygon fill. I don't use this very much, but I'll show you what it is real quick. So polygon fill is this. And so what this does is when you click on this, you should be able to see. And um, we're not working here, but let's try this again. I don't know why polygon fill is just suddenly not working here. Uh, that's right. Mm, hello. Make sure you're on the right layer. So if you can't select it, learn through mistakes, right? So no matter how many times I've used this, I'll also have that happen every once in a while. Why is that tool not working? So make sure you click on the appropriate layer. So now we'll try this again. Boom. You should see that you have your wireframe in there. And uh, whatever color you have set is the color that you can fill your polygons with. So you can either paint them directly into the polygons you see here like this. And then this will all become red polygons, right? So if we wherever we find that on the geometry, it will be red polygons. Or what we can do is, of course, fill in and make them red here. Right. So you, yeah, and after actually where you're holding it, it doesn't fill them in until you let go of the mouse. Once you let go of the mouse, then it's official. Right. And of course, you can change the color and fill different polygons. So this is dependent on the polygons. So if you actually model in a certain way, then, yes, you can just fill them in with a color. Now, you can also choose other things. You don't have to just do it by the um, uh, what you see there by the polygons. You can also go in here, which is triangulation. It looks like vertices, but basically it's the triangulation. So, you know, any triangle within a, um, a polygon, this is polygon. So you can just choose different polygons. This one here is entire element. So that entire element has now been turned purple. 
just by clicking on it. Um, and then the same thing you can do with over here, which is basically UV shells or UV islands. So an entire UV island, if you click on, will do that. And it'll work the same if you click in here. If it's a uh, UV island, it will do this. Since this is all one piece, that's why the whole thing shows up like that. The inside of his hand is not, and you'll notice that the inside of his hand did not get textured, even though the rest of it, because that's not part of the UV um, shell or island, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So there you go. So there's that tool. As I said before, I don't tend to use it very often, but it exists. Now the smudge tool, this is pretty obvious. It smudges things. So, you know, if you have a texture in here and you want to smudge it uh, on the geometry, you can come in here and just smudge it, right? There you go. Awesome, right? Not much to it. So that exists. The clone tool. And uh, so uh, what I'm going to do here is actually, I'm just going to back up a bunch until we get back to our little met guy. There we go, all right. So the clone tool works like this. What you typically wanna do with a clone tool is you wanna make sure that the layer that you're on is set to pass through. Um, so this layer is normal, but we're gonna set to pass through. This will allow you to basically clone anything that's underneath. So if I just have the layer on as such as this and I click on my clone stamp tool and if you kind of come over here and we take a look clone tools V plus left mouse button in order to set the source. So if I want to set the source to this guy's head, we'll click hit V click left and now you'll see that the little box around it shows you that that's the source, right? So as I start painting, I will paint that, I'll clone that on a different spot. Now, if you want to paint anything underneath it, that's where the pass through comes in. If I actually have this set uh, to turn on down here, now I can actually paint uh, even the, um, the copper area. So if I come over here, I can start painting a different part of the copper. So we'll set it again. Okay, so let me just say I'll choose once again, uh, press the V and left mouse, so V, click. Now it's been set down there. Now I can move over here and start painting and it should start you can see right there it's now painting this part of the um uh, of the copper red uh, bleached area right so as long as it's set to pass through it will work make sure once again you're on the right layer but pass through is important to copy anything that isn't on the layer that you're copying so i copied mr met originally because he was on the layer but as soon as i wanted to paint anything below that i had to set it to pass through okay so that's how that works uh you do have a color picker up here Okay, so you can just go in and choose colors, right, and pick them. Um, so if you have the brush and then we turn the picker on, I can come in and just choose a color. And it will even not only just choose colors, but it can also choose an entire um, material. So a smart material or a normal material can be eye drop. So it's not just for colors. Now here's your awesome mirror tool that I was talking about on a couple of other videos. Um, keep in mind, as far as the mirror tool goes, I'm just going to go in and grab a brush here. So let's go to brushes and I'll just do a default brush. And now we have that blue color from the Mets logo, but we'll turn on it and you'll see that you'll get this kind of plane. Now the plane can, if you see right here, it can be changed and mirrored on a different axis. This is when I was talking to you guys about uh, making sure that the axis of your model when you first exported it was in the place that you wanted because if it wasn't in the center, let's just say your axis was over here, well now all of a sudden you're going to get your planes down here and so your kind of symmetrical painting is not going to work right, right? So you can set it to X, Y, or Z. We'll just leave it on X here. Um, and then maybe I'll go uh, and start painting on his arm. And you'll see that if I paint on his arm over here, anything I paint will show up on the other side too, just the same. Right, so it just kind of mirrors what you're painting on both sides. This actually is really awesome for characters and character texturing. Right, so now you don't need to have overlapping UVs to create the same effect, which is why you can't, you know, you can't do that anyways um, in here. But that's that kind of helps you with that. Uh, this thing is just hide or show the plane. So if you don't actually want to see it while you're painting, uh, and so you can kind of see a little bit better of what's going on in between, you can do it that way, or just you know go back and show it again. All right, so that's how that tool works. We kind of covered some of these other tools, so we know that. We talked about the material picker. We talked about the symmetry. So pretty much that is it for this video. So I just kind of wanted to quickly cover that, um, those concepts. So this, at this point, covers the majority uh, of the things I want to talk about. If there's anything else uh, later that I realize I missed or want to cover, I'll throw in another video. Uh, but this should pretty much do it for you guys. So hopefully this video series worked for you guys. It taught you a lot. And uh, thank you for watching. And I'll see you guys in the next one.